Welcome to Future Hindsight. I'm your host, Mila Atmos. Each week I speak with citizen changemakers who spark civic engagement in our society. Our guest today is Louise Dubé. She's the executive director of iCivics, an organization that was founded by Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, who's the first woman to ever serve on the Supreme Court. iCivics reimagines civic education. Its mission is to cultivate a new generation of students for thoughtful and active citizenship. Justice O'Connor founded iCivics in 2009 because she believes that the practice of democracy has to be learned and relearned with each generation. We understand the importance of the skills that civic education builds. So hopefully as we move forward, we're going to have a re-examination of what it takes to create a healthy democracy. It is not possible to run a democracy without investing in our kids. We'll be talking about the necessity of high quality civics education and the many benefits for our children and for our society at large. We'll also be learning all about the smart and engaging programs in the iCivics curriculum, such as media literacy, and how to have discussions across differences. And finally, why we all need to invest and be invested in this space. Let's listen in. Thank you for joining us. Oh, I'm so pleased to be here. Thank you for having me. This is an important subject. Civic knowledge is, of course, a prerequisite for civic participation. And yet civic education has largely disappeared from our school curricula for several decades now. Why has civic education disappeared? Yeah, so it may be slightly overstating to say that it has disappeared. Many students still get some coverage of civic education as part of their middle school, high school, elementary school. What they don't get is high-quality civic education that prepares them for the challenges of our democracy. The reasons are many. During the 60s, the relationship between the citizens and their government became frayed over issues of trust and around the civil rights movement. And we saw just a slow erosion of the investment in education that was about the government and about our institutions. Uh, there are quote-unquote soft skills that are much harder to measure, and we were measuring the performance of schools according to test scores. I think we've come around to a different place now in our country, and we understand the limitations of testing in that way. We understand the importance of the skills that civic education builds. So hopefully, as we move forward, we're going to have a re-examination of what it takes to create a healthy democracy. It is not possible to run a democracy without investing in our kids. Right. Tell us a little bit about how you do that. How does iCivics provide high quality civics education and how does that benefit our democracy? So Justice O'Connor was quite convinced that we needed to start early. So we started to design a program for middle schoolers. These are students in grades 6 through 8. We want to design a program that's going to appeal to your average kid. And your average kid is often on technology and often loves gaming. Justice O'Connor happened to meet the father of educational gaming, Professor Jim G. at Arizona State University. And he convinced her that this really was where students were at. And if we could use that technology to engage students, we would actually be able to reach a whole set of students that we wouldn't normally be able to get to. So instead of just learning about the three branches of government by filling out a a worksheet, you would actually be a congressperson. You would be the president of the United States. You would be the mayor of your small town. You would understand what it would feel like to have these choices before you. You might build uh, an interest, an empathy, and an understanding of how the system works and how it impacts you. A lot of times, students look at civics as something that's separate from their lives. The reality is regulations about climate change or legislation about guns or all of these things, it impacts students, right? And and so we want to make that connection for them. So we have 20 educational games and we have 200 lesson plans. We have now grown out of middle school into high school and also at the elementary level. So we have a full program to engage students in the exploration of what civics is for them at their appropriate development level and to teach them about how our government works. What is the favorite game? I looked on your website. They all look super exciting. Win the White House. Love it. You have to build your own campaign. Think about your debate. 
do your fundraising and all that. But in general, what's maybe the most popular with your first demographic, the middle schoolers? So the most popular game is Do I Have a Right? In that game, you run a constitutional law firm, and then clients come to you and ask you whether they have rights. You have to assign them to a lawyer that has the competency for that case. So first you have to decide whether they have a right, and then you have to find the lawyer that matches their case. Hard to do because uh, you're going to have to acquire these lawyers that are a little bit expensive, and so you're going to have to win cases to get money so you can buy lawyers, and then sometimes clients come and then you don't have the right lawyer, you make them wait, and then they get frustrated and they leave. So you have to buy a dog so that they can pet the dog so that they can become less frustrated and so on and so forth. So it's a it's a very popular game. But our most recent one is Race to Ratify. And um, that game is about how we adopted and ratified our Constitution. And we have a debate between Federalists and Anti-Federalists, and students go around and talk to people, people like a sharecropper or a small businessman and sort of make up their own minds about this Federalist and Anti-Federalist arguments, and then they create their own pamphlets to uh, influence the debate about the ratification. Well, I love that the first game you described is really complex, and that would not be the game I would have picked as the most popular for middle schoolers. Tell us a little bit more about that, because one of the things that you say is that civics education is really the place where kids get to learn how to think about these issues, talk about them civilly, and come to agreement and have an action plan. Yeah. So what's difficult about civics is that it has very long vocabulary. It's kind of difficult topic that I think is what you're reflecting. And what we've done in that particular game is to make sure that students have resources to go to if they need help. So we have a case analyzer in which if you don't understand all these big words about amendments and and this and that, you can go and try to create a logic tree for the problem that's before you, and it helps you sort of build an understanding of what the case may be about. That's the kind of things that we do to make sure that middle school students can follow the program. And once they play our games, it is not the end of the process, right? We call it the game sandwich. It is the beginning of an exploration with their teachers. We spend a lot of time with teachers. We have over 200,000 registered teachers on our site, 6.2 million students last year. And we try to make sure that teachers have what they need to conduct a discussion. Because we understand that while games are very engaging, they are not the end of the process. There must be discussion, and particularly discussions across differences among students, in order to build understanding about what these issues are about. And sometimes you listen and you develop those skills to listen to somebody you disagree with, and you are actually able to evolve your own thinking. For example, in our game, Win the White House, it will be new for 2020 with the election issues that are likely to be in the actual election. And those issues are represented from both sides, both the Republican and the Democratic side. A lot of them are the same issues, but they use different language and have different goals. And what we want to do with that is to make sure to encourage a conversation. And we want to make sure that teachers have the right tools to foster those conversations about a topic even as controversial as, you know, environmental policy, for example. So uh, some people will think that this is a good policy or composting is a good policy, whatever it is, not everybody agrees, right? And so we need to have some way to talk about those things and then to act. We also have a set of projects that the students can do using their gained knowledge, either in their community, in their town, or more broadly in their state or otherwise. So, That's very comprehensive. Uh, and I like what you said about fostering dialogue and finding ways to do that. In fact, one of the things that you aim to do is to deliver this civics education in a nonpartisan way. How can you ensure that the teachers can do so successfully? I think it's one of the hardest issues we have right now because uh, teachers are facing a lot of pressure from a lot of different ways. So I've had a lot of teachers write to us in the last midterm election as well as the last presidential election. And they said, you know, 
I'm having a hard time teaching, and I've been told by my principal not to teach politics because of the polarization in our country. And I use iCivics because it actually grounds me in what it is supposed to be. iCivics serves a great role in that because you can actually anchor it in, yeah, it does take 270 electoral college votes, and you, you, you're better to understand how the system works. You can argue about whether this is the right system or not, and you can have a discussion about that. We also have resources for teachers to be able to structure conversations so that everybody is heard and that they actually think very intentionally about the skills that need to be built, listening actively to somebody else, for example, and sort of waiting your turn, not interrupting somebody, and actually present an argument on your side, but that builds on something that somebody else says. Those are all skills that need to be developed. It's a considerable amount of research that shows that discussing controversial issues in the classroom is very helpful. So that is not always understood, and I think that it would be very helpful to have broader-based discussion about the value of those things so that teachers are well-supported in their explorations on these topics. How do you train the teachers to deliver this curriculum? We believe everyone will be a part of our community and they will be part of our civic life even when they're not a citizen. So we need to have everybody trained. In order to do that, we need to make our resources as easy as possible. So a teacher can come to iCivics and start within 15 minutes. She can be up and running. So there is no pre-training. Our goal is to make things easy, to save them time, and to make it sort of a civics in a box kind of thing. After that, we have created a series of videos that teachers can use on particular issues that deal with the pedagogy of how to teach civics particularly. In addition to that, we have in-person training available for teachers. So we have a network of 220 educators. There are most knowledgeable and biggest fan base. And they sometimes do the training if we're not in that city, or we do it ourselves. So we go to districts and we do in-person training and try to walk them through customized training about their own programs, their state-based program, their pedagogies, and their uh, standards. Civics has both different kinds of pedagogies because uh, it is so active. It needs to be in action, needs to be project-based, needs to actually require output from students, and it is also across all disciplines. When you're doing civics, you're also doing English language arts by teaching students how to write an argumentative essay, how to read a primary source, and so on. If you could change the policy around civics education, what would you advise? We've been working on that for quite some time. About a year and a half ago, we founded something called Civics Now. That is a project of iCivics, and it is a coalition of now 111 national organizations that have come together to say, we need to prioritize civic education in our country. Some of the things that we've done is to develop a state policy menu, a prescription for policymakers at the state level that covers topics such as classes, how the formation of teachers and the certification of teachers should occur for civic education, and so on and so forth. And then we have been working very directly in specific states. Uh, since 2010, uh, we've seen an acceleration of the policy at the state level in specific states. So um, it started with the Sandra Day O'Connor Civic Education Act in Florida in 2010, which was implemented in 2014, which is a middle school class with an exam. And then in Illinois, passed a requirement for a high school class a few years ago, and then recently passed 
civics in the middle, so requiring at the middle school. I'm from Massachusetts, and we have a coalition there with other organizations in the state in which we pushed for a civics bill that would incorporate new standards at grade eight, which created a civics course, in addition to two civics projects for every student in Massachusetts. Many states passed the immigration nationalization test as a high school requirement. I think there were over 80 bills in uh, state legislatures over the course of the last session. It's very promising, and uh, we hope to help state policymakers design the best program possible for their state. Wow, that's very promising. Like you said, that's uh, really amazing that people are taking this up and taking it seriously at the well, local level. Well, there are level. 50 states, you know, yes. so <laughs> there's still quite a bit of work to do. <laughs> right, right. So well, how do you how do you foresee that rolling out over all 50 states? What's your strategy there? Um, well, uh, it, it would um, take some doing. I think that what has been missing in this issue is investment at a serious level that matches the scale of the problem. We have a very different democracy than we did maybe 10 years ago. We have a digital democracy, which involves a set of issues that we haven't seen before. And I don't think anybody has the answers, but we kind of need to take up the issue. That scale of problem and that scale of disinterest on the part of young people in democracy 25% of young Americans think that democracy is either a bad or a very bad system of government. That, that's unheard of. It's a global phenomenon, and it needs to be addressed. We need to reestablish trust between our institutions and young people, and then we need to actually have our institutions evolve to meet the need of what is a very different population that we've had in the past. So all of these things require investment, including state policy level in all 50 states. We hope that there are funders out there who are interested in this topic who are going to pick it up and, and uh, make a difference because it's very hard to run what is now the oldest democracy in the world without a serious investment in education. And that investment must come from the government in some way or others. But when the government doesn't do that, we kind of need to cause it to do that. Otherwise, the whole system breaks down. Right. So what you're saying is that we need investment at the level of, let's say, the Department of Education to prioritize civics in all 50 states? It's a state-based responsibility, so it would be within the state policymakers primarily. There may be things that the federal government could do, but mostly it will be at the state level. And it would take some pretty serious investment on the part of the states. In Massachusetts, we just passed the budget for the civics bill, and it's $1.5 million from the state coffers. We are trying to match it with private money because $1.5 million for all of the students in Massachusetts is not enough. But it is something. It's more than we've had. So as we trust our children to take over this democracy, very important to invest in that process. And so one would hope that parents play a big role in this, as well as policymakers. One of the things you mentioned earlier was that Justice O'Connor wanted to start early. Mm -hmm. And you identified middle school, but you also now have an elementary school unit and you have a high school unit. Is there a perfect time to engage kids in civics? Is it ever too early or too late? What we need to do is to create appropriate standards that go from kindergarten all the way through. And in fact, in college, right, there's a lot of civic engagement, attention and energy at the college level. None of this is perfect right now. There's still a lot of work to be done to make sure that we align all of those things to create truly engaged and productively prepared students. But there is no time that's too early. What's interesting is among certain immigrant populations, the, the research has found that a lot of students who are particularly immigrants find out about these things. They do not find out about them in the home because parents weren't educated in the United States. They then go back and actually teach their parents about how the rules work in the U.S. and sometimes engage their parents in voting. So it's, it's kind of interesting that it can go both ways. It can start with the parents or it can start from the school. Meeting in the middle is what's important and, and making sure that we all understand our obligations. Many of the bills that are in state policy right now include pre-registration of high school students for when they turn 18. Very cool. So what do you expect, let's say, an eighth grader to know about civics? I'll just take the Massachusetts course. Massachusetts course is pretty in-depth. 
It includes both the foundations of our government, the history of how we got our constitution, what the Bill of Rights is, is about. It has a review of Supreme Court cases that are important to how we govern ourselves now. But it also includes new subjects that I think parents would be interested in. For example, media literacy. There's a whole unit about media literacy and teaching the tools and the skills to understand how to engage in our digital democracy. There are very specific things that students need to know. Everybody says, oh, they're digital natives and they know everything. The reality is they do not understand how disinformation works and the level at which that can occur and how to check sources and so on and so forth. We need to pay attention and we need to teach our kids very hardcore skills about that. There is also a unit about our local government. That's very important, right? Because you get more and more polarized as you get out of your local locality. Um, if we focus on trying to get engaged in what is happening in your town, what is the development in your town, there is a civic life and you need to know about it. It can be very complex, but also interesting once you figure out, you know, who's in charge and how you might make change. Who might you even talk to if the lights are too bright in your town or if there's not enough lights and it's not safe for you? So those are sort of the broad sort of national history uh, and civics, our national institutions, local institutions, and very direct focus on media literacy. If you want to play the game, but you're not in one of the schools that uses iCivics. Can you just go to the website or how does it work? Yeah, you just go iCivics.org and then you click on play and you then have the 20 games. It tells you a little bit about the games. And if you started, for example, with a younger student or younger child, um, might try something like Immigration Nation, a very easy game, all upgraded last year about the rules for immigrating to the United States which is actually very complex. And then move up to a game like Do I Have a Right, a Race to Ratify, and then ultimately Argument Wars, which is probably one of our hardest games, Supreme Court cases. So yeah, completely free, go and play. You can play on uh, most tablets, uh, but not on phones. You're clearly very, very passionate and super knowledgeable about everything when it comes to civics education. What inspires you to do the work that you do? My kids. I have two boys. Uh, one's in college, one's in high school, and uh, I look at them and I look at our democracy and I think that our founding fathers, as well as the incredible depth of commitment from so many Americans to this system of government, is both a challenge and a responsibility. So I feel very strongly that uh, this is not a spectator sport and that we need to get involved my own personal opinion is there's a generational shift here happening in our country and that the solutions long term are likely to come from the new generation in that we need to empower them with the skills. It's not fair to just throw them at problems. We need to have them understand what came, why these decisions were made and how the system works and then let them take it with knowledge and with the skills required. But I look at my own kids and I hope to do a good job in in that process and uh, hope to make that possible for all other parents. If I want to help all Americans have high quality civics education, what are two things I can do or any parent can do? I would find organizations that you believe in and I would donate. We are all in the civic education field really working with a very, very small budget. And then I would get involved with my PTO or my school committee in the schools in which my children attend and try to pay attention to what kind of civic education program the schools have and then talk to the social studies coordinators who usually are the people responsible for this at the local level about you know, what we could do to improve what we have, to link it with outside programs, to strengthen the social studies class or the civics class, to provide resources for teachers to learn opportunities inside the classroom, outside the classroom to learn more. Between the two of those things, I think uh, we would all be much, much better off. Agreed. Looking into the future, what makes you hopeful? Oh, a, a lot makes me hopeful. I think the, the level of interest in civic education is changed a lot since I started. This is my sixth year at iCivics, and I would say the momentum is building every single year, and there is a 
general understanding that the situation as we have it now is not going to get us to where we need. So I am very hopeful that both policies and funding and parent commitment will come together to change the situation so that we can have a healthier democracy within a few years. And uh, I'm very hopeful about our country that's full of incredibly generous and knowledgeable people. So I think uh, building on this local leadership and community leaders and policymakers, there's just so much to this country that's profoundly rich in terms of social capital and social fabric, and that is committed to democracy. I definitely feel like uh, there's a lot to build on. Terrific. It's good to be optimistic. Thank you again. This was really fantastic. It's absolutely my pleasure. Thank you so much for the great questions. There's so much about this conversation that makes me hopeful. Not only the fact that Louise mentioned that there is increased interest in the last six years, but most importantly, because iCivics does so much to bolster democracy in America. As I expressed in the episode, I'm impressed by the curriculum that iCivics has crafted. It is comprehensive deep and multidisciplinary. It is probably the only way to learn and think about civics that does justice to the task of educating our citizens about their responsibilities and opportunities. Still, there's room to grow. We all need to demand from our government that high quality civics education be taught in all schools. There is a civic life in our town, in our state, and in our country. We are de facto a part of it, and we need to know how it works and how we can actively partake. For a country that prides itself on being the beacon of democracy, we deserve nothing less. Next week, our guests are Hannah McCarthy and Nick Capodice. They co-host the Civics 101 podcast, a refresher course on the basics of how our democracy works, making it easier to understand for everyone. They explain that our democracy is not a spectator sport, that we must know the rules and stay in the game. It is my belief that the most important thing a citizen can do is to understand the system in which she lives. And that can only come from admitting that you don't know something. In in the wake of all of of the 2016 election, there were a lot of hot takes. It was everybody going on and writing these think pieces with the assumption that everybody knew everything about how our political system worked. And that made people afraid to admit that they didn't know what the chief of staff did or the secretary of defense did. And so I think it's one of the most crucial steps is to be willing to say, I have no idea what the people in the House of Representatives do. If you don't understand the system you're in, you can't change it. Tune in and stay engaged. I'm Mila Atmos. Thank you for listening to Future Hindsight. The executive producer and host of this program is Mila Atmos. The audio producer and music composer is Peter Fedak. The associate producer is Miriam Zumbu. Additional production by Brooke Sayan. Listen to us online at futurehindsight.com or your favorite streaming service.